Okay, everybody. Welcome back to a very special edition of your favorite class. Today I'm recording, uh, it's about 4.50 on Wednesday night. I'm recording the lecture uh, that would normally have been given on Friday, but this Friday I'm gonna have to be away, so I can't give it live. So instead I'm gonna make this recording and you can sort of watch it on your own time. And the beauty of having a recording is that you can pause it at various points to copy things like example problems and some pictures I might want you to draw in your notes down and I'm not gonna have to wait for you to draw them. So at certain times you might hear me say, go ahead and pause right now um, so that you can sorry, copy images or copy the problem statement down. So I wanna just get right into it and pick up where we left off and reminder that we were working on buckling. So I'm just gonna get right back into the notes where we had sort of left off earlier today today being Wednesday, um, where we had just finished an example problem looking at buckling of a slender column. So up to this point, we've sort of assumed certain sets of boundary conditions on our particular bar. So the question then is what happens if we have different boundary conditions? You know, we derived the critical buckling load for a pinned, pinned configuration, but what if we have different boundary conditions on our member? And that's where we're gonna kind of pick it up today, is what happens if we have different end conditions. So what about the critical buckling load for other boundary conditions? Okay, and so what I mean by that is, remember, we derived the critical buckling load as the following. For a pinned pin boundary. So remember what that looks like in our particular situation. That is going to be this sort of pin, our beam and pinned boundary condition, which we sort of load on the end with the value of P, okay? Now the question is what happens if we have a different boundary condition? So for example, like a pin, well, let's not do pin fixed. Let's do um, fixed free. Okay, so a fixed free boundary might look something like uh, the following. You have your beam, a similar looking beam. One end is free. Let's make this top end the free end. And then the bottom end is like fixed into the ground in some way. Okay, so what happens if we have this situation? All right, so this would be kind of like a fixed on this end and completely free on this end without any restrictions. So the question is, how do we sort of derive or change the critical buckling load to account for this uh, new situation? Well, in this situation, the governing differential equation does not change. We still have the same governing differential equation, which so looks something like d squared vx dx squared plus omega squared vx equals zero. This governing differential equation for how the beam responds does not change. This would again yield the same general solution. Which would be that v of x is a sine omega x plus b cosine omega x. The only difference now is the boundary conditions. So remember when we had the pinned pinned configuration, we had a certain set of boundary conditions which we utilized to whittle this general solution down into a particular solution that allowed us to solve our variables like a and b. Okay, so if we have alternate boundary conditions, so with alternate boundaries, we have different 
boundary conditions. For instance, if you're looking at this fixed tree, you might have the boundary condition that, again, your displacement at x equals 0 is still equal to 0. This might be something that is still relevant. However, also at x equals 0, because of the sort of beam coming into a fixed end, the slope at x equals 0 of that particular beam must also be 0. So this might be one boundary condition. And then a second boundary condition might be the slope, which remember is the first derivative of the elastic curve at x equals 0 is 0. So we could utilize these two boundary conditions inside of our governing differential equation, whittle our way down the same that we did for the pinned pin configuration, and come up with a new critical buckling load specifically for this set of boundary conditions. Okay. So I'll say could work this down. Or I'll say re-derive. With these boundary conditions. All right. And similarly, you could figure out what the boundary conditions are for some other um, setups, like uh, fixed um, with rollers, or uh, pinned fixed, or some other types of boundaries. Okay. I'll say, or others, like. fixed plus roller or uh, fixed plus pin. All right. So depending on the boundary conditions that you sort of have, you're going to have a different uh, critical load which pops out. Fortunately, it's actually rather convenient defining these critical loads by introducing a new idea, which is called the effective length of a beam. the effective length of the beam. This is usually given as the variable L sub E or sometimes L prime. The point is we can just modify the current critical buckling load equation that we have for the pinned pin configuration by sort of replacing the length of the column with some effective length that is representative of the boundary conditions that we currently have. So we can substitute effective length into pin pin critical load equation to account for alternate boundary conditions. That might look something like the following equation. So we then have our critical load is equal to still our n squared pi squared ei. Now it's not over just l, but here we call this the effective length le squared. All right, so this is our new sort of critical buckling load in this situation, where LE will vary with boundary condition. And we know for pinned pinned configurations that the effective length LE is just the length of the column L. 
So for pin, pin, the effective length LE is simply L. Some alternate effective lengths that you might see are for this fixed fixed configuration. I'll show a picture of this in just a second so you understand what I mean. Fixed fixed, your effective length is L over two. For fixed free, your effective length is uh, two times L. It's kind of what I drew up above. And then finally for fix pin, your effective length is equal to 0 0.7 L, or more specifically, this is root two on two L. Textbooks like to use 0 0.7 L because they don't think that you're smart enough to understand root two on two. I think you're smart enough to understand that. OK. So this is a more exact answer here. OK, now here are your various effective lengths that sort of are working their way into the critical load equation based on your boundary conditions. And I want to bring in a picture here that sort of illustrates these effective lengths quite well. And this is a picture actually right from your textbook. So here, let's bring in a picture. this picture here. I particularly like this picture because it illustrates this idea of an effective length. So here, remember, this is our sort of like pinned pinned configuration. This is the configuration where we derived the critical buckling load um, earlier with the boundary conditions in the whole nine yards. And we see here that like we're labeling the effective length as this full column length L. And we see that it has this general like half sinusoidal shape, right? OK, so that's important, this half sinusoid. All right. Let's compare that to like a fixed fixed configuration, which you see here. This is like a fixed fixed configuration. We see this like half sinusoid. But it's represented in sort of this portion of the bar here is like your half sinusoid. And that's because we have some sort of these like conditions on the built in ends that we have to come in with no slope. OK, so because of that, like this length here becomes what is like the effective length and the effective length here in this particular bar is L over two. So we see for fixed or built in ends, we have an effective length that is L over two. All right, it's like this half bar length to get our, you know, half sinusoid. For fixed free, here we have fixed free. This guy is sort of like uh, bending in this kind of configuration. And we might consider this as like one half of our sinusoid. So here's like one portion of our sinusoid. And we could sort of continue this downwards twice the original length of this uh, bar to give us our full half sinusoid. And so it's pretty easy to see then that like the effective length here is going to be two times the total length of what this current column is. All right. Last, we, ha we have this kind of funky one where it's fixed and pinned. And in this situation, we have an effective length of root two on two L or what your textbook writes as 0.7 L. So I particularly like this picture because it shows physically sort of these effective lengths um, in kind of like an intuitive, intuitive uh, manner. All right. One last thing that I have to note here is that we've talked about slenderness ratio already. Recall our slenderness ratio. And it was this um, ratio that is the total length of the bar divided by the radius of gyration. I'll say when calculating this, when calculating slenderness ratio, use the effective length. So what I mean by that is if you're calculating slenderness ratio, you really want the effective length LE over the radius of gyration. So if you have a fixed fixed configuration, use an effective length of L on two. Um, if you have pinned pinned, use an effective length of L, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So let's look at an example problem now where we have different boundary conditions that might affect about which axis our, our member might buckle. 
So this is sort of the last example problem in uh, the first set of buckling notes, and I'm going to put that up on the screen right here. So here we have the structural steel member. And in this particular example, we have different boundary conditions for buckling about the Y axis than we do about the Z axis. I'm going to give you a second here. I would encourage you to sort of pause the video right now and sort of read your way entirely through this problem. And then I'll come back in just a second and revisit uh, the boundary conditions and what I sort of mean here. OK, so hopefully you paused the video and kind of digested this problem a little bit. So what you'll notice here in the instructions is it says the left end of the column is fixed. So on this portion where we have like the YZ plane, that is fixed on that left hand side of the bar. And if I'm going to rotate this particular member about the Z axis, see we have a pin there uh, on the right hand side of the bar. So if I'm trying to buckle this about the Z axis, I have a fixed pinned configuration. That's different than if I'm trying to sort of buckle about the Y axis. In that particular situation, I would have fixed on the left and also fixed on the right. OK, so because of this particular situation, we have to be mindful of which axis is more slender. So we're going to calculate the slenderness ratios about each one of these two axes. And when we're calculating the slenderness ratios, we know that Whichever axis has the largest slenderness ratio is the axis about which we will buckle. But when we calculate the slenderness ratio now, we're going to use effective lengths of these slenderness ratios of the lengths of the bar, considering the boundary conditions of our particular beams, and then compare the slenderness ratios with the appropriate um, boundary conditions for each one of these two axes. So let's get into that now. I'm going to sort of copy this guy over to uh, the writing pad directly, this whole problem statement. Just so we can sort of like talk our way through um, what I was just kind of pointing out there. So like I said, fixed here on this left hand side. And on the right hand side, we're pinned for buckling. about Z and fixed for buckling about Y. So let's get into this problem. Um, there's a lot going on here. We have a factor of safety in here as well, which we haven't really talked about. So I think it's a good problem to talk about boundary conditions, factor of safety, all, all of the good things. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this. Now, remember the first thing we really want to take care of is determining the buckling direction. So about which axis are we going to buckle? That's the first thing that we really need to take care of. And to do that, we need to calculate the slenderness ratios for each one of these particular axes about which we might buckle. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw a picture of the cross section. And label the axes appropriately. So we're told here that this is a sort of a wood cross section and it's one inch by two inch. So here we go one inch by two inch. And if I kind of like go up and look at the picture, uh, we see here that I'm kind of from this direction, like down the X axis, I'll have Y up and Z to the left. So if I want some coordinate system, maybe my coordinate system is Y up Z to the left for this particular problem. All right. So now I want to do things like calculate the area moment of inertia about Y, the area moment of inertia about Z. That'll allow me to calculate radius of gyration, which will allow me to calculate cylinderness ratio. So let's go ahead and, and take care of this. First thing I want to do is area of inertia about Y. That's going to be 1 12th um, B cubed H in this situation. Okay, which is going to be 1 12th base cubed, 1 inch cubed times the height, which is 2 inches. And this will give me uh, area of inertia about Y, which is 0.167 inches to the fourth. Similar idea for IZ, except here now this is 1 12th BH cubed. So here we have 1 12th the base, which is 1 inch times the height cubed, 2 inches cubed. So this will give me an area moment of inertia about Z, which is 
inches to the fourth. All right. Okay, so we're on our way. Now, uh, I need the radii of gyration about each one of these particular axes, so let's continue. Remember, my radius of gyration is the square root of the area moment inertia about the area. So here, about y, we have 0.167 inches to the fourth over the area, which I think is pretty easy to see, is two square inches. One times two. I did that in my head. What's up? Can you deal with that? All right, so the radius of gyration about y is going to be 0.289 inches. And the radius of gyration about z, similar procedure, you're going to end up with 0.577 inches. Okay. So now I'm about ready to calculate my slenderness ratio. Remember, slenderness ratio is the length of the column divided by the radius of gyration. But before I do that, I have to identify my boundary conditions. So now, slenderness ratio. And I will say that about Z, I've already kind of talked about this. We have a pinned fixed configuration, which means if I go back to my chart, my effective length here is going to be 0.7 times L. Or if you want root 2 over 2 times L, I'm just going to leave it at 0.7 for now. And about Y, I have a pin-pin configuration. Okay, So my effective length here is just going to be, oh, sorry, not pin-pin, fix-fix. Sorry. So here my effective length is going to be one half L. All right. So I am ready now to make my way through the calculation. All right. So my slenderness ratio, my effective length divided by my radius of gyration about Y. Here's going to be my Effective length about y is one half. The total length of the column, uh, I'm told, is uh, 10 feet, so that's 120 inches. Divided by my radius of gyration about y, which you calculated before, is 0.289 inches. And so my effective length divided by my radius of gyration about y, my slenderness ratio here for this particular bar is going to be 208. Similar idea for about Z. Here, my effective length is 0.7 times the total length of this particular member, which is 120 inches. All this divided by my radius of gyration about Z, which is 0.577 inches. And this will lead me to a slenderness ratio about Z, which here is 146. So here I have my two slenderness ratios, which are now accounting for the boundary conditions properly. So pause it right now if you if you want to sort of challenge yourself and think about about which axis am I going to buckle given these two different calculations. All right, so I hope you had a, a chance to think about this and notice here that since this slenderness ratio is larger, we will be buckling in this particular problem about the y-axis. Okay. So it's interesting because the y-axis is the fixed fixed configuration. So if we go back up to our picture here. Here's this y axis. So if you think about, you know, bending about this, that would be kind of like swaying kind of to the to the right or left kind of kind of idea here to to end up for your for your buckling about y. So maybe intuitive, maybe not by the picture, but we just let the math take us there, okay? So the number step number 1 is figuring about which axis you're going to buckle. Now, since we figured it out, we can just go ahead and use our buckling equation directly. <clears throat> 
remember we have this modified critical buckling load, n squared pi squared ei on e squared. And here, since we're buckling about y, we're going to use iy. And since uh, we want the lowest possible value for the critical buckling load, we'll take n equals to 1, which is the first buckling mode for this particular piece. All right. So we can just put some values in here and be on our way. So here, it's just going to be 1. I'm not going to write the 1, but pi squared times the modulus of this particular guy. It was given in the problem as 29 MSI. So I'll do 29 MSI multiplied by the area moment of inertia about y. Calculated this above as 0.167 inches to the fourth. All divided by your effective length squared. Here we've kind of already done this, but let's go through it one more time. The effective length is half of the total length, so one half of 120 inches. And this entire thing squared. So if you go through this, your critical buckling load here in this particular situation is 13.3 kips, which is obviously 13,300 pounds. So that's your critical buckling load. Notice we haven't talked about safety factor yet. So we need to um, sort of mention that now. We've calculated this critical buckling load with no safety factor. So we need to sort of accommodate for that. And I think it's pretty obvious if we have a safety factor of two, we just probably want to divide that critical load by two. Then we would say our allowable is this critical load divided by two, which here is simply going to be 6.65 kips. All right. So if they're asking for some safety factor, don't forget about that particular guy. OK, good. So that kind of puts a cap on our first set of buckling notes. And I'm now going to move towards the second set of buckling notes. So if you need a second to get that up, you can you know, pause the video. Otherwise, you know, I've uploaded these notes to Blackboard, and you should be able to sort of follow along with the, the next material. OK. So the next set of buckling notes introduces a couple of new topics. And the new topics that we want to talk about is what happens if we're in this gray range between you know, a material being so short that it's going to fail by yielding versus a material that we know is very, very long and will fail by buckling? What about some sample that is kind of in the middle? Okay, We call this the intermediate range. Does it still stick to our original critical buckling load that we derived? Well, not really, and we're going to talk about that here. And the second thing we want to consider is what happens if we're loading these columns not directly in the center, which we've kind of assumed so far, but eccentrically, you know, with some additional bending moment? So if, for instance, you had some cross section, I'm just going to draw this quickly, of some long slender column, assume that this is like very long and slender in this direction. We've sort of assumed that the load is right in the middle of the cross section. But what happens if we were to load this guy not right in the center, but like maybe at one of these edges? We're going to introduce a bending moment in this cross section as well. And how do we deal with that? So those are the two topics that we're going to tackle in this next set of notes. So the first one I want to talk about is what happens if you're sort of in this intermediate range. So um, let's talk about the intermediate range. of, uh, let's say, column slenderness. Slenderness ratio. So we know from our critical buckling load, so if sample, say if column is long and slender, so the picture you should kind of have in your head is a picture that looks like this. Obviously, this guy is very long and slender, and you're sort of loading it in this particular fashion. Then we know that the critical buckling load, or the, the load that will cause failure, is going to be something like pi squared EI over LE squared. All right, compare that to a situation where you have a very short sample. 
So if column is short, maybe you have something that, um, I don't know, looks like this guy. OK, so what happens if you load this thing up? Well, if it's short enough, this is just going to fail by yielding. So, you know, the critical failure load is, you know, just going to be um, whatever the yield stress is times the cross-sectional area A, right? Um, so, you know, the stress that will cause yielding is just sigma naught. Here, the stress that would cause failure is we know um, pi squared E over L E on R squared, your slenderness ratio squared. OK, so the point is, if your columns are very short, you're going to fail by yielding. If your columns are very long, you're going to fail with buckling. But what happens if you have some intermediate column? What about an intermediate length? OK, maybe, I don't know, that guy. Let's say that's intermediate. Well, my critical failure stress is, I'm not sure. Is it this? Is it this? Is it something entirely different? Um, let's talk about it. Okay. In an ideal world, you would say that there is this very distinct boundary between where it would fail by buckling and where it would fail by yielding. And you could sort of imagine what that might look like if you plotted the slenderness ratio versus the yield stress. So let's plot the failure stress as a function of slenderness ratio. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's make a graph. And on the x-axis here, we have the slenderness ratio, which is like Le on R. OK. If my slenderness ratio is very, very small, will fail by yielding. OK, and that's because I have like this short sort of short stout little bar okay so in that situation my failure stress would be the yield stress sigma zero okay so we can think about regardless of sort of the slenderness ratio on the low end um, if it's sufficiently short it's just going to fail by yielding so if my slenderness ratio is like very very small then i'm basically going to fail sort of like by yielding and it's going to be a constant value all right Compare that to the failure stress that you might get by buckling. And that failure stress that we get by buckling is going to be an equation that looks, I don't know, something like this as a function of slenderness ratio. And we know that this equation here, failing by buckling, is something like pi squared E on your slenderness ratio, Le on R squared. So here is this particular line. It looks something like this that I've sort of drawn here. OK, so if it's small, going to fail by yielding. If large, it fails by buckling. According to this equation, the more slender it is, the lower the stress required to buckle it. OK, so that sort of makes sense. And in an ideal world, there would be this like magical value right here that would sort of dictate when you go from this like yielding failure of a short sample to a buckling failure um, from like our Eulerian theory. OK, so this is Euler's theory. Eulerian theory. 
Now, people have tried to replicate a graph that looks like this with experiment. And what they find by experiment is that, yeah, kind of on the far left and on the far right, this is legit, like this particular idealized situation. Okay, so this is like the idealized line that would tell you where it was, where it would fail. But people run experiments and they sort of determine that, yeah, that ideal sort of model that you might see for how this is going to fail is not really realistic. OK, in actuality, it looks something a little bit more like let's consider these X's as like data points. In actuality, it looks something a little bit more like this. Right, this is real data. So maybe it's some trend line or something that looks a little bit more like this. All right. And so what we see here is that it's not following an ideal situation. And in fact, we're going to fail at lower values than you might predict with this idealized theory. OK. So this region that exists in this particular graph where it's not following sort of the short you know block yielding theory and it's not following the buckling theory on the right hand side is called the intermediate range so this particular um, graph might call this region the compression range you might call this actually the the slender range because we're slender enough to sort of follow the Eulerian buckling theory. And all this stuff in here, this is called the intermediate range. All right. In this intermediate range, you're not following the compression block theory. You're not following the Eulerian theory that we sort of derived in last lecture. It really kind of is its own demon. And this intermediate range is a result of many things. It's a result of materials being imperfect. Oh, geez. So it could be voids, you know, holes inside the structure, um, internal flaws. Etc. Imperfections, maybe the, the material has previously been yielded and there's some stress history inside of the piece. OK, that could be another thing. All right, so imperfect materials and non idealized loading is another case here, which we'll talk about in a second. So non-idealized loading. Specifically, what I mean by this is like eccentric loading that, you know, you might have some bending moment applied, sort of kind of what I talked about at the onset of these notes. So eccentric or oblique loading. So eccentric or oblique loads. Eccentric, you would have additional bending moments. Oblique loads, you would have shear sort of imparted to the material. So um, these sort of, you know, non-idealized loadings can contribute to earlier failure than you might predict with the compression or the Eulerian buckling theory. Okay. Now, how do we go about calculating what, you know, the actual failure load is in this intermediate range? Well, sadly, the only way that we can really know what this intermediate range looks like is to do a bunch of experiments. And so a lot of people over the years have done experiments to sort of figure out exactly what that curve looks like in their intermediate range. So the intermediate range 
varies by material. And if you go to the notes, you can see some examples of some of these intermediate ranges. I'm going to I'm going to pop a few of them in here just so you, you sort of get an idea. Um, So here, this is for aluminum. Don't worry about these uh, equations here. I'll talk about that in a second. This is for aluminum 2014 T6. So alloy 2014 temper 6. Here's another example for a wood. If I can get this in here. Ah. All right, it's not it's not enjoying that these guys are so close to each other. All right, maybe I'll just put it below it. All right, here's an example for uh, wood. So this is a uh, Douglas fir. And so we see sort of like this would be like the compression block range for a short sample. This range down here might be the Eulerian theory, which remember is like pi squared E L E on R squared. So your Eulerian theory. And then you got this like weird range in the middle. here, which is this intermediate range. OK, and that sort of like intermediate range has been obtained from experimentation. All right, similar idea up with the aluminum. OK, here's the Eulerian range. Here's the compression block range. And then this range here is this intermediate range. OK, so there's some examples. And like I said, these curves are gotten by experiment. And the idea then is that people will fit uh, experimental data to various equations that define these locations. So we want like an intermediate range here. Well, we can model the actual data that people have gathered over the years as some equation that exists in that particular range. All right, same idea here up here for this aluminum. There is some equation that can be given that sort of di dictates what this line is, and also values that dictate sort of the boundaries of that particular equation. So what is the appropriate slenderness ratio domain, right? Okay, and these equations are given in a variety of handbooks, codes and standards. If you are using a certain material, then you can look up what the intermediate buckling range is for, I don't know, whatever material you want. Some steel, some aluminum, a lot of composites have this now, uh, etc. And your book has one example of some codes that they have taken that allow you to predict if a material is this slender, this is the equation that you can use to predict when it's going to fail. And so those tables and charts are useful. I have put one in your notes and it looks something like this. So this is kind of a big table. Here, this is also available in your notes. And so this table is sort of giving you all the information you need to define the domains of those individual regions and also what equations are useful in that particular domain. And the domains are given by slenderness ratios. So for instance, let's take a look at this aluminum 2014 T6. If that's your alloy and that's the aluminum that you're using, it tells you here that 
if your slenderness ratio L over R is greater than 55, that you're in the slender range meaning that you can sort of apply those Eulerian buckling equations that we've talked about before. And they give those equations to you right here directly using values of like E, you know, pi squared E on effective length squared. So we see these equations that we're sort of used to now for the critical buckling load by Eulerian theory. However, if we're less than 12 on our slenderness ratio, it's telling us just to use the allowable stress as the yield stress of the material, which is 28 KSI. And that's because if we're very, very short, meaning we're, we're not very slender, we're like this very short aluminum sample, it's gonna fail by yielding. So it's giving us that the allowable stress is the yield stress of that particular aluminum. Here is the domain that defines the intermediate range between slenderness ratios of 12 and 55 use this wacky equation to tell you what allowable stress you can handle in this intermediate range. All right, so that's how this chart is basically read. Um, so that's going to be it for now. Uh, I've gone for about 50 minutes. Um, when we come back, I'll do an example problem that utilizes sort of this intermediate range and we can sort of see exactly how these tables actually work and how the intermediate range might affect um, the predictions that you might make. Thanks for coming on this uh, sort of off day. I'll be back on Monday uh, again for another another standard lecture. So I'll see you then.